Hello, I'm Des Dilov. Welcome to The Thinkers 50. My guest today is Claire Kelleher, Professor of Organisation and Work at Cranfield School of Management and an expert on flexible working. She's also an advisor to the UK government's task force on employee engagement. Claire, welcome. Now you've been working in the space of flexible working for a long time. It's one of those ideas and, and kind of culture changes that seems to have been a long time coming but never seems to quite arrive. Yeah, I mean, I think there certainly has been interest in flexible working for many years now. Um, and there are some quite significant differences between the degree of progress that organisations have made. Some organisations have policy and adhere to, in the case of the UK, the law, um, but don't necessarily seem to have gone much further. Whereas other organisations, it's sort of normal practice, it's embedded in how they do things. So how many people are affected by flexible working now? Well, I think one of the interesting things is actually it's more widespread than we would necessarily think um, because our research and indeed other people's research has shown that actually there's a lot of informal flexible working taking place. So rather than people making a formal request to change their working arrangements, it's very often a relationship with their line manager. They have a chat with the line manager about, you know, they'd like to work at different times sometimes or they'd like to work remotely on some occasions, perhaps because of something that's going on in their outside work life but also perhaps because of the type of work that they're doing it would actually be better to work from home when they want to concentrate and so I think we found that um, actually it is a lot more widespread and interestingly um, although flexible working was perhaps introduced in many organisations as a diversity initiative um, men work flexibly as much as women in many organisations but it's through this informal route largely rather than making formal changes to their working arrangements. Arrangements. And that makes sense. But where it doesn't happen, where, where there's a real resistance to it, is it, is it a problem? Is it a trust issue? Is it a power issue? What, what's your sense of that? Well, I think it's both of those in many ways. I think it's managers, perhaps, who have adopted more of a sort of command and control approach, if you like, um, like to be able to see their employees and be able to see how they are performing. And it may be that they are apprehensive about how well people will work if they're not physically located in the office. I think it's worth remembering, though, that not everybody who comes to the workplace necessarily works very diligently all of the time in the workplace. Workplace is also very distracting and as a result it may be that people can work more effectively when they're out of the workplace. And we're not saying that, that, that there isn't a place for being in the same location working with people or even, even locking at times people's diaries so that people um, can, so it's easier to, to, to get meetings are we? We're not saying this one or the other. Absolutely not. I think that um, there are some types of work which inevitably are done better when people are able to communicate face to face and are able to spark off ideas, which is harder for that to happen if people are using other types of technology to communicate. So I think that being able to have a balance that whether there are times when people need to be co-located and to generate that type of collaboration, um, but equally there are other times when that may not be needed and so matching those different interests is to me one of the important things in terms of success for organisations. Because the danger otherwise is we've got this situation now where we've, we've perhaps um, removed some of these long tedious huge meetings we used to have and we've replaced them by the equally time-wasting conference call. Sure. And we've all sat in on those conference calls and you think I don't even know what they're talking about. I don't know who half these people are, but there we sit fiddling with our keyboards and things. And that, that's not that's not good use of time either. No, absolutely not. And I think sometimes when technology has allowed lots of people to be involved in a meeting, there's been a tendency to involve lots of people. And it may be that actually a more focused meeting involving a smaller number of participants who really have key inputs might be a more effective way to do it rather than saying, because we can, we'll have a greater involvement in meetings, uh, in making them productive. I think it's important to think about that. The other thing that always surprises me is, is quite often you find that the very companies that you think should be good at this stuff, and I'm thinking of the IT companies, the companies that have the enabling technology, are actually the companies that aren't so good at it. 
there are certainly some examples of that. Um, and technology, I guess, is only one issue here. Yes, it is an enabler, particularly for people to work remotely or to work at different times. But there are other factors, not least culture and management practice or the historic management practice in organisations, which influence the degree to whether or not really um, flexible working is put into practice and put into practice in an effective way. And interestingly, of course, we've had this example of an IT company that almost seemed to be turning back the clock by asking people to, to come into the office and work. Yes, the example of Yahoo was where previously people were working remotely quite extensively um, and the decision has now been made to bring people back into the organisation requiring them to have an office to have somewhere that they're based. Um, now I think in some ways that was quite a surprising move given the nature of the organisation um, and may reflect the types of changes that um, the new chief executive wants to put into place. But it seems to me that you can create some of the opportunities for collaboration and creativity even when people are working remotely for some of the time. It isn't necessarily an either-or situation. Um, a company which I guess has been successful um, in terms of delivering flexible working would be BT British Telecom who um, have been very much at the forefront of doing this so they would be an example of a technology company that has successfully implemented flexible working. Do you think, I mean, part of the problem is, is perhaps it's a misnomer to talk about flexible working because you know the clue is in the word flexible and quite often it may be an alternative way of working but it can become quite rigid where people simply don't come into the office or you're losing some of the benefits of having because clearly there are benefits of people you know, being in the same location. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess flexibility is a very general term or it's been used in very general ways and indeed it's included both employers wanting flexibility and employees wanting flexibility. Um, and so really I think we have to get down one step further and actually look at the practices that are taking place in organisations. Um, the research that we've done here at Cranfield has shown that choice over working arrangements is actually the things that brings the benefits from the employee employee side. So employees able to exercise some choice, that's when you get the positive spin-offs in terms of higher degrees of organisational commitment or people working harder. So can you give me an example of that, put that into Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, from our work we found that, for example, when people are able to work remotely, particularly from working from home, they often work longer hours. So they tend to typically start working at the time that they would leave home for the office and then maybe carry on working until the time that they would normally get home. So they're actually putting in the time that would be work-related, but more of it is actually spent on work-related on work activity. So that's good news for organisations? Absolutely. Yes, I mean I think there are many things that um, our research and indeed other researchers have found positive spin-offs for organisations in terms of um, performance, in terms of commitment to the organisation and also influencing stress levels in some cases. But that's not to say that there aren't circumstances where flexible working um, perhaps does not deliver good results and as a result it's important to recognise the circumstances where it's important to have people together to collaborate, to communicate, rather than seeing it as either one way or the other. I guess too at this particular moment in time when people are under a lot of project, um, pressure, a lot of budgets are under pressure, there's a danger that people end up working, overworking as well it, it, rather than you know, in, in the old days where people were concerned that people would be um, perhaps skiving. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, increase, the increased opportunity for connectivity to work at really almost any time and in any place means that potentially people may um, work harder and potentially to their detriment. Um, certainly our research showed that greater work intensification as a result of people working in different forms. Um, and I think that's something that organisations really sort of need to keep an eye on in the sense that what they don't want to have is a situation where they lose some of the benefits because of some of the costs to employee health and well-being. I mean, you mentioned people working in different places and obviously that's one of the big benefits of, of flexible working. But given that we now work in a, you know, very much in a global world, there are different time zones that we have to cope with and deal with. To some extent, I mean, you know, flexible working is a, is a way of life for most of us. 
Sure, absolutely. And I think particularly in those organisations that do work globally, um, the notion of sitting, being co-located with the team that you work in is perhaps, you know, now quite outdated for some organisations and equally having to work at different times. Now, of course, teams don't always have to have real time communication, but in some circumstances that's needed. And as a result, if you've got some people in Southeast Asia, some people in the US, some people in Africa, for example, then some people are likely to have to work outside their normal working hours in order to be able to have that real-time communication. Okay, now clearly, to me at least, it's very clear that perhaps spending three or four hours on a train every day is not, is not the best use of, of anybody's time, frankly, unless you enjoy train journeys. So flexible working, it's got to be a good idea. We need to do more of it. What is the single thing, in your view, that needs to change in order to liberate people and for, for organisations to really get the benefits as well? Well, I think that perhaps organisations really being convinced about those benefits. I think even in the organisations that do flexible working well, there are pockets of resistance. And often that resistance is managers who perhaps haven't had much experience of flexible working and as a result see the need to be able to um, observe, to have their people present in order to manage them effectively. Now, I think it's about really saying, well, if people people work in different ways, how do we need to set up management systems and processes in order to do that? Um, it seems to me that that's really the challenge for organisations. It's not about developing policy, but rather it's about saying, how do we put our systems, our practices into place to accommodate different types of working arrangements? And presumably there's the usual situation where there's a, a sort of a pendulum that moves between the organisational need and the individual need and, and somehow aligning those two things. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really the next big challenge for many organisations because, of course, many organisations seek flexibility as well in order to reduce costs or to be more efficient in their operations. And I think being able to look at what individuals want in terms of flexibility and what the organisation may need in terms of flexibility and to match those two up is an important way forward. Um, and it seems to me that some organisations have tried to do it perhaps at the level of a department or an individual manager doing that but I don't think there has necessarily been much sort of concerted effort on a most, more strategic basis to link up the different forms of flexibility. Okay that all makes good sense but as individuals as managers and as employees what can we do as individuals to try to try to create a, a, a healthy um, culture of flexible working? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of creating a culture, um, I think that often showing um, good examples of where it's worked, and um, one of the things that our work has shown is that people who are flexible workers themselves, whether they're managers or co-workers, are much more open to working with flexible workers. But I think there's a real issue for managers to think about what it means when people work in different ways. And indeed, you could argue that there's a role for HR departments here to actually provide support for managers. So if somebody's less visible, um, how do you assess them? If people have fewer opportunities to interact with their colleagues and learn from their colleagues, how do you provide that opportunity? in a different way? How might people communicate effectively with people that they're not necessarily in the same location or at the same time um, working together? I was actually in a telepresence call recently, so I was in London and we were connected to Tokyo, so it was the end of a very long day in Tokyo and, and th there were a group of Japanese managers around the table and unfortunately one of them had fallen asleep at the table so his boss who was also in a meeting the only, the only time he saw him probably in, in, in sort of a few weeks was to see him asleep at the table so that wasn't all that helpful I suspect. Absolutely not and I think you know this is one of the um, costs if you like in the sense that my guess that perhaps that person in Japan had already been working for quite a considerable amount of time and it might well have been beyond the end of their normal working day and as a result um, having that exposed I guess was not very um, good for them but I guess there's a need to recognize again you know that you may have some people who are very bright and lively because it's first thing in the morning and for other people it may be the end of an, an, a difficult or arduous day and as a result may be performing um, at a different tempo than perhaps people in other parts of the world so I think you know there is a, there is a cost there in some senses one needs to recognize is how important or um, how significant those costs are for whatever the job in hand is. 
Last question. Is, is there a, have we found a link between flexible working and people being more engaged with their work or is that is that a kind of a bridge too far at the moment? Yeah I mean I think there's certainly a general relationship and it goes back to this point about choice when you allow people discretion so that they can arrange their work in such a way that it fits better with their non-work lives you know that builds a better relationship with their organisation and indeed we often find greater commitment and people sort of feeling some degree of you know reciprocal relationship because they've been allowed to accommodate their non work lives to a certain degree with the demands of their work lives. Claire Keller, thank you very much. Thank you.